Welcome to the last show of 2023. It will be about Ask Me Anything, so you can prepare your questions. We will get started soon. Don't go away. Just a quick reminder before we start. Please know that whatever you hear in these live sessions or any content you see on social media by Savirov's law firm is general information only and not legal advice. While we may use certain real-life scenarios or legal cases for learning purposes, it is important to remember that this does not constitute a legal opinion. For personalized legal advice, please consult with your lawyer or hire a Canadian immigration lawyer. Now, let's get back to our show. And welcome to the show. As usual, we will start with our news pieces. So news piece number one is Canada's population growth is rapidly going up and uh, you, you can see here according to statistics canada we are already reaching 40 million 500 thousand people as the population grows rapidly so please check this census and all the interactive material here you will take take a good look at where canada is going in terms of population and perhaps as a consumer market Second question, second piece, uh, I'm sorry, second piece is about the housing market. According to RBC Thought Leadership, Canada's housing market downturn is spreading across major cities. And this, this report will give you an overview for the months of November. And uh, the house sales are not that great, but the good side is the house prices, the downturn on house prices are seen in different uh, municipalities such as Toronto, Winnipeg, Halifax, and, and other places. So take a look at this report. It will give you a good look uh, on housing situation in Canada, which is one of the hot topics in the country. And the third piece is the future of work, how you can attract the right talent. And Canada West Foundation has published uh, a report on this, uh, a piece which, which I find it very useful for our business immigration clients who want to come to Canada to do business and hire local talent. These are the strategies by the foundation and it's a good material to consider when looking for talent in this war on talent that we have at the moment. So today we have great guests, so stay tuned. My experts uh, from my team will be coming and sharing their knowledge. Please make sure that you have questions. We have some questions ready but we will, back, we will be back in a moment. Stay tuned. Are you constantly on the move, managing your business, and looking for a convenient way to stay informed about expanding your business to Canada? Look no further. Introducing Speaking of Canada, the podcast that keeps you in the loop on all things related to Canadian business immigration, delivering the latest news and valuable tips, and captivating interviews, no matter how busy your schedule gets. Speaking of Canada has got you covered. Okay, let's get to know our guests today, experts in business immigration. Marianne, why don't you start, start over? Welcome. Thank you so much, Rahmad. Yeah, so I'm a business immigration lawyer um, with the firm. I've been uh, working in this field for uh, the last three years, and we've been seeing some exciting new developments and changes happening in what has been unprecedented global times. And uh, we're seeing that translate into the immigration system and really every facet of society. So exciting things came in 2023. We're expecting exciting changes as well in 2024. And uh, yeah, look forward to speaking about it today. Excellent. Welcome to the show. And now let's get to know Owen Ag Angus Yamada. Hello, Owen. Great to see you virtually. <laughs> Hi, Rachmat. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, so my name is Owen. I am the business associate here at Sobarov's Law Firm. Uh, my role mainly revolves around helping clients plan their business uh, for Canada, you know, whether or not that's expanding an existing business or starting their own or purchasing a business. And then I also work with a lot of uh, stakeholders in Canada, so it's by economic development officers, real estate agents, uh, and trying to help connect our, our clients with them to set them up uh, for success in Canada. Excellent. Thank you for taking the time. I know it's a busy time of the year and we're almost at the end of the of the marathon. So let me ask the first question, Mariam, to you. How was 2023 in, in your perspective when it comes to business immigration to Canada? Yeah, 2023 was an exciting year. It was full of uh, a lot of highs, a lot of new, exciting, good changes, and also some uh, 
some more stricter stringent uh, change that we've been seeing. So um, the biggest things that I can, you know, point point to right now are the changes in the express entry uh, tech talent and LMIA process. So we've seen uh, express entry draws specific to uh, sectors and to French language proficiency. So that was a new development, um, trying to fill in the labor market gaps in specific industries um, like healthcare, STEM, um, trades, uh, things of that nature. We also saw the tech the tech talent strategy come out with a number of different uh, updates and programs that have been very interesting. One of which was the H-1B specialty occupation visa holder that saw 10,000 um, H-1B uh, US visa holders get Canadian work permits uh, or specialty visas. Um, the program was capped in, maxed out in 48 hours. And of course, there's the changes to the SUV uh, program that, um, were brought up. Um, and then with the LMIA process to support employers uh, in labor, um, the uh, Economic Social Development uh, Canada has introduced new measures to kind of streamline and make that process a little bit easier, especially for uh, companies that rely a lot on temporary foreign workers. So we are seeing some governmental federal level responses to what are very, very real needs in the labor market. Excellent, excellent overview. Let me ask you a more question on the changes that, for example, uh, digital nomad change and other digital strategy changes. Do you think you, you, you already felt the effect of those changes that were announced in the middle of the year in your practice? Yeah, so I mean, first and foremost, even getting uh, like there's no official program yet for digital nomads, but even recognition that digital digital nomads exist and remote work is um, prevalent all over the world is huge. Um, it's a sign that we are kind of catching up to the realities that we're facing, that employers are facing, trying to attract talent from abroad. Um, so that's fantastic. We're also seeing a lot of updates um, to how LMIAs are being processed. Um, you know, as I said, there's streamlined programs for repeat um, uh, employers who repeatedly use the program. Um, but we haven't seen, honestly, a specific dedicated stream to business immigrants within the tech field. Um, it's still highly, highly focused on employees, which I mean, makes sense given that the priority right now is to fill in gaps in the labor market. But what this means for, um, you know, insp aspiring or current business people and business owners in Canada is that, you know, whether you're Canadian or whether you're on a work permit, building and starting a business and running a business in Canada, you felt that labor market shortage, that that gap in uh, available talent. And so um, hopefully relief is incoming. Excellent. Thank you for the overview. Now let's switch to Owen. Owen, what have you noticed in 2023 in terms of uh, the business climate in Canada? Yeah. So, I mean, if 2022 was the year of inflation in Canada, I think 2023 is probably the year of interest rates. So uh, we had you know, increasing interest rates, especially in the early part of the year. And I think that really impacted a lot of debt holders, especially people with uh, housing mortgages with variable um, mortgage rates. And so they saw that, you know, the, the amount they're paying in mortgages can go up even like a thousands, uh, more than a thousand dollars a month. And so I think that really had a, a bit more of a downward pressure on uh, discretionary spending. So a lot more of you know, uh, retail that or stuff that are not really non-essential goods are kind of took a bit more of a dip in this year. Uh, with that being said, I think, you know, forecasted to be a bit more, <laughs> a bit of an improvement in next year, but uh, yeah, the interest rates have really sort of driven down that, uh, that market. And again, it's, uh, it, it doesn't mean that all of Canada is, has gone down. It's just that some of the, like more of the you know, uh, luxury markets or stuff like uh, that are non-essential goods are um, kind of taking a bit more of a hit later on in this year. Excellent. Uh, th thank you for this uh, brief overview. Now we have some questions from the audience. Please continue typing while we have those. Uh, I I'm looking at the screen and I will continue with my guests for now. Oh, no, we have a question right away. The username Sweet Mills is asking the question, if someone is on an open work permit or an ICT, intercompany transfer work permit, can he or she apply under startup visa or provincial nominee program, entrepreneur program? 
Mariam, per perhaps this is the question for you. Yeah, so the startup visa and PNP programs are honestly geared towards uh, permanent residents, so they don't necessarily impact what kind of work permit you can hold. Um, the startup visa program is its own permanent resident program that you apply through uh, for its own processing. And the PNP entrepreneur programs really, um, you know, they add points towards your express entry. Um, so from that aspect, there's not really... Um, they don't clash. Um, one thing to keep in mind with both of these programs is uh, when you apply, you'll, you will need to uh, maintain uh, work permit status until decisions are made on your application. And for uh, some PNP uh, entrepreneur programs after, the, after that as well, um, because they will want to check in and see how your uh, business is going, especially with respect to um, significant benefit you're creating, business activity, you know, startup visas are very, very big on um, the innovation aspect. And for PNP programs, they're more so uh, focused on um, your physical location and keeping your business in those provinces for the time being. So the short answer is there isn't anything prohibiting you from applying for either one if you're on an open work permit or ICT. You just want to keep in mind what the requirements for each um, program and each stream will be. And perhaps may, if I dig further on that question, Mariam, the first uh, question should be why the switch? Okay, why are you switching from one type to another type of essentially work permit in the, in the initial stage? What's the purpose of switching to startup visa? So based on that purpose, if the yeah. purpose is getting permanent residency, more or less, I wouldn't use the word guaranteed, but more or less with high probability of getting PR, what would be the your your take on that uh, switching from one yeah. type of work permit to the startup visa program um so i mean listen the change would really come as an extension perhaps to your work permit um the startup visa um work permit provision specifically now include uh consideration for significant benefits so that's something people want to keep in mind in exploring what um work permit is most suited for them or what they have the higher likelihood of uh, success with. Um, <clears throat> but typically that switch is to tide you over until the decision is made. So start a visa, uh, the PR component is still taking something like three years to get a decision. So you want to really cast your sights into the future um, in assessing, okay, what does this look like? Why would I need to switch my work permit? When is the appropriate time to switch my work permit? Um, and how will this balance out with the business I'm running and also the, um, the PR program I'm applying to. So um, the startup visa work permit itself would be the C11 entrepreneur um, stream uh, work permit. These are closed work permits. So especially if you're considering switching from an open work permit to uh, a different one, you want to keep in mind what this also means about your flexibility and your ability to work for different employers versus um, one set employer. Um, that's a big thing to keep in mind as well. Okay, great insights. Thank you, Mariam. Uh, I will take one question live from the audience and one question that already came to us before the show. So let me continue with the ones that I have on my paper. So can you dis discuss, any, any of you, maybe both of you, can you discuss uh, the following? Uh, as we move forward with the, after the pandemic, what kind of impacts of pandemic in 2023 has all you've been feeling still lingering around in terms of immigration and perhaps business environment in Canada? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I'll take the, the business environment uh, mm -hmm. question. I think, yeah, it feels like a long time ago that we initially had the, the pandemic and everything locked down, but I think a lot of trends from moving um, you know, more online uh, with work and especially you know having uh, less reliant on going into an office or having a de designated office space is uh, something that's really kind of continued to to move forward after the pandemic. Of course, there are a lot more larger employers, and this has been a lot more in the news that are pulling back employees and, and making them come into the office. But I think just in general, the amount of people where the expectation is to to be able to work hybrid or even work remotely um, is is there, and is also something that you know a lot of 
uh, even like nonprofits and stuff are, are offering to be able to attract better talent um, in that aspect. So I think that that expectation of how you're going to recruit employees is, is something that's continually lingering, uh, lingering on. And I, I think it was kind of already sort of trending that way before the pandemic, but it really accelerated that. And I think where, you know, some people thought we might kind of go back to exactly where we were in 2019. I think we're kind of still in that position in terms of how we actually do work, um, at, at least for more like professional level jobs. Obviously, there's some some positions that you can just never really go uh, have virtually. But uh, yeah, I think that's a, an important consideration if you're trying to start, a, you know, more of a professional service type company in Canada. Yeah. Thanks, Owen. And Marian, what's your take? How how the effects yeah. of the pandemic are still lingering on uh, around with respect to immigration processes? Yeah. So um, one thing that we can say is we're seeing uh, there are areas where we're seeing delays from COVID still stretch on. Um, backlogs are still being cleared. Um, and in other areas like the express entry um, and VR program, uh, we're seeing processing times slowly but surely return to what they were pre-pandemic. We're not we're not quite at six months yet, but it's definitely, um, and it's not super consistent, but it's definitely quicker than we were seeing during the pandemic. So that's one thing that's been fantastic. Um, as I said, the digital nomad uh, classification has also been huge. Uh, just the recognition on um, on a um, institutional level has been great. Recognizing that you know remote work is the future; it's the present. Um, with that, though, there is a little bit of a double-edged sword for employers. So one thing that uh, employers are being asked to um, uh, justify or explain is not just the need for the employee in the company, but the need for their physical presence in Canada as a prerequisite for, um, you know, getting that LMIA approved or getting that work permit issued to their employees. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, we're also seeing officers becoming a lot more discerning. So we heard during the pandemic, they, um, the mass hiring that IRCC did, the mass investments um, they, they made into training, um, you know, immigration officers, and we're slowly but surely seeing that also come to fruition. So officers are now a lot more discerning uh, about the business plan, about feasibility and viability in a way that um, they weren't during the pandemic. So you can see that uh, training really paying off. And what that means is um, in the same way that officers are looking into business plans for feasibility and viability, applicants need to be just as invested and just as um, discerning with that. Um, and we're very lucky at Swabros to have a team of business associates like Owen who, um, who are able to help clients through that process. Great. Now let's take another question from the live audience that are participating from across the world. Uh, this is a long one. I will read it for you. I, I hope you can see it on the screen too. Uh, this is from Aziz Bek. He's asking, as a PhD associate professor from Uzbekistan with over 10 years of experience and English proficiency at C1 level, married with three kids, I'm interested in exploring immigration opportunities to Canada for my family and myself. Could you provide information on any immigration programs that would be suitable for professionals like me? So it's a generic question. Perhaps, uh, Mariam, you can take on that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, it's generic, but it's also very case specific, I think. Uh -huh. um, there, as I said, so things to keep a lookout for. Obviously, express entry could be an option. Uh, take a look at the different streams. Um, C1 level, I'm going to, I'm assuming that's CLB level one uh, in English, um, which may pose a little bit of uh, a setback. There may need to be investment in language proficiency. Uh, uh, sorry, Mar Mariam, C1 level could be quite an advanced level. I, I'm not, I'm not proficient in that, but he yeah. says that oh. he has a professorship, English proficiency, okay. and three, three kids. Per perhaps he is beyond the age of 40, which is the determining yeah. factor in terms of immigration. So uh, those things, yeah, so age and language proficiency will need to be, um, like, will be factors, very determinative factors. Um, there's a couple of PNP programs as well across the provinces that focus on academic and professionals um, that may assess, assist with that and granting additional points towards uh, PR. Um, really, it depends on what the immediate and ultimate goal is, is, you know, is the immediate goal to get a uh, employment as a professor in Canada? Is it to um, 
you know, that's what I mean. It's a generic but but loaded question. If it's business immigration, there may be opportunities for uh, business visas, business work permits. If it's, you know, the immediate interest is study permit, that could be an option. If it's just regular employment, you're looking at LMIAs or possibly LMIA exempt work permit programs. And with PR, um, the best bet may be a, a PNP program. Great. Now let's switch this question in a modified version to Owen. Owen, if this person were to establish a business in Canada, what would be your suggestions in terms of what industries could be open for a person with such qualifications? <laughs> That's a difficult question to answer because I, I, I think what's missing is some background on the uh, on you know this hypothetical situation. Uh, associate professor in in what field and what other kind of relevant experiences are going to be there. I, I also think you need to kind of juxtapose the opportunities in the market with uh, the skill set and the preferences of the client as well. Uh, there's no point of just saying, hey, you know, you can go open up X type of business if the interest just isn't there. And so ultimately, you want to be able to find that balance between what makes business sense and what's going to uh, kind of be something that they would actually uh, want to be able to do. With that being said, just more general uh, options for professors. I know a lot of professors uh, do a lot of consulting. Uh, a lot of them leverage a lot of their expertise in specific domain knowledge in that field, uh, as well as um, a lot of professional speaking and, and training opportunities. Uh, I, th I think those are really more, uh, perhaps maybe more for like, uh, for business professors, you know, like uh, in the social sciences, uh, more in terms of like uh, mathematic, mathematics and science professors, this also might be uh, kind of doing freelance work. And you know, again, it, this might be more consultation or actually just working as a project manager in a specific uh, company. So um, there are there are some very, uh, you know, very specialized skills that they could leverage. It just sort of comes down to you know, the background of the individual. Great, great. Uh, thank you for the answer. Now let's continue with my list of questions. Uh, Mariam, how, if you can elaborate on this, what are the common challenges faced by business immigration applications in 2023 that you can highlight maybe one or two the the biggest challenges that you you saw in our clients uh, applications yeah so um right off the bat there's a, a push from ircc for significant benefit factors in immigration applications obviously the, there's uh, three categories of significant benefit economic social and cultural so we're seeing officers turn their mind more and more uh towards a holistic approach to significant benefit and what that means um they are evaluating it based on location as well so um it's not it's not like a one size fits all right so even if we're going to talk about economic uh benefit for example um Two common ones are job creation and foreign direct investment. In both of those cases, they won't just look at face value of what you're going to create. They will look at what you're going to create in what field, um, what you're going to bring, like uh, funds wise, what you're going to bring and what kind of positions you're going to create and the volume of positions you're going to create specific to the region and sector that you'll be creating it in to determine if that is deemed significant. Um, so that is that is something that's uh been recurring in officers notes is their assessment of significant benefit um ideally um the best case scenario is you hit on all three social cultural and, and economic if you can um another thing we're seeing is as i said a lot of um greater scrutiny over the business feasibility and viability so it's very much tied to uh um the business plans which is owen's domain um, another thing more generally we're seeing is a focus on um, temporary intent. So uh, especially now post pandemic, um, Canada is encouraging and does want to get a lot more um, long term uh, PRs and immigration going. Uh, that being said, there's a lot more. There's still a focus on proving intent to return after um, a temporary duration, temporary status has ended. Um, more generally as well, if we want to take the immigration part of it out and focus on what our challenges business people face in Canada and what they should plan for, cost of living, cost of doing business, I'm sure Owen can also um, attest to this, going way up. So expect a need for greater investment um, for sure. There's also, uh, again, 
entertain different areas. I know the hot spots are Toronto, Vancouver, and Montreal, uh, Calgary as well, big cities or bigger cities. Um, but the costs of doing business there are also going to be higher. Uh, up, the markets are going to be more saturated. So it may be worthwhile to entertain um, smaller cities or towns or more rural areas um, depending of course if it makes sense for the business like it's not you know again it's not a checklist of, uh, of factors um, so and again we're back to labor shortages right so hiring creating opportunities for Canadians is fantastic but be uh, aware and plan ahead for possible rate labor shortages you might experience um, because whether you're Canadian whether you're not if you're a business owner in Canada, if you're in any kind of managerial or executive position, you know the pain of these labor shortages all too well. Great, thank you. Owen, what's your take on this, uh, the question related to challenges for the entrepreneurs in Canada and how to overcome them if you, if you can? Because you work with uh, our clients in building their idea and business venture. What challenges yeah. are they experiencing, Owen? Yeah, so I think Miriam covered a lot of the challenges uh, that we've seen over you know the 2023 period um, to overcome a lot of those challenges though i would say that a lot more planning has to go into the process and of course yes i i do help clients with the planning so obviously i am a little biased in saying that but uh, it, you know genuinely speaking you know you, you can always propose something on paper and say hey, i'll do this you know, I'll do X business, but the more you're able to take steps into being able to establish a business, especially that we, you know, we work so remotely now, we have the ability to connect with different suppliers and stakeholders online. We have the ability to you know, run market research uh, through another company uh, from, a, from a distance. So I think being able to take those steps and to validate your business idea from before just going and getting that work permit, I think that's really gonna strengthen the business case and overall strengthen the the business immigration case and i i always like to say to clients you know it's, it's business immigration and so from my perspective it should be a very strong business case first and then the immigration will follow behind it um sometimes it's just if you if you're thinking only i need immigration asap and then i'll figure out the business i think that that's just going to result in a weaker case and a lot more uncertainty in terms of actually being able to execute the business so Again, trying to do as much as possible upfront and kind of build incrementally is something I would say to, to overcome some of these challenges. Thank you, Owen. Let's get to the questions from the live audience. Uh, there's one in, uh, I will try to read now. It's, it's coming to the screen. Okay. Can someone transfer the employment location from Ontario to Alberta in the second year of intra-company transfer work permit? startup company i will Mario? take that one yes 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 <laughs> uh, it is possible you want to again take a look it's always important to take a look at the information in your work permit because that will also include location of work so there are certain cases where uh well in general if there's any material changes to the conditions of your work permit you need to apply to amend it you don't necessarily need to change the type of work permit, but you need to apply for an amendment to factor that in. Um, you also want to, in this case, as an ICT, um, in preparing your application, you want to comment on that switch. Why are you switching provinces? Why are you looking um, to make that switch? And how does that impact your business plan um, and business execution goals? Um, that's a drift. Um, we've done that a lot. We've had it happen a lot with our clients where they, you know, they plan for something, they come and experience it on the ground. They're like, um, there's better opportunities in a different location. And, um, we, we work with them through that. Great. Now let me switch gears a little bit. We know in the middle of the year in around June, July, we had a new immigration minister. I don't know why the timing was so bad because in the middle of the year, uh, you know, bringing the new guy on to the to the to lead the immigration, Mariam and Owen, what's your take on the this new new guy in the block? Uh, he's doing great things, perhaps building upon the previous minister's efforts, and uh, things are moving along. But he had only six months to prove. Uh, you know, some, some progress or positive change. Maybe we'll start with Mariam on that. Sure. So as you said, it's been a six month record. It's hard to tell at this stage what was um, already in, in uh, the works 
under Minister Fraser at the time versus what a uh, minister introduced now. What we have seen is a lot of emphasis on proficiency. Um, so we see that in the new, um, you know, express entry specific French speakers. Um, we see that in his announcements to uh, focus on French proficiency programs. We also have seen changes to, uh, or crackdowns, if you want to call it, on um, <clears throat> students and international students and, and their work permits, or, or sorry, study permits, not necessarily because of international students themselves, but as a response to what is a housing crisis that they're experiencing and, you know, conversations about what the responsibilities are on these institutions that are um, bringing students over and encouraging and supporting them to come. Um, so we've seen the, the the change coming into effect in January over the, the uh, proof of funds requirement going from about 10K to now over 20. Um, we're also seeing that in, you know, Minister Miller commented and specifically put this to universities uh, to figure out and universities and colleges and other DLIs to figure out a plan or he would, you know, IRCC would cut the number of visas they're issuing to international students. So I think it's still um, a little too early to tell. The tech immigration strategy, again, came just at the cut. Uh, the tech talent strategy came at the, the cusp. So um, one thing I want to see uh, next year is actually the the actually the IMP innovation stream and how that comes into fruition. We were expecting it this quarter, but it didn't happen. Um, and I would like to see. But we have we still have a, a few days left of the year, so let's let's be be hopeful a little bit on that. The innovation yeah. stream, you mean, right? Yeah, we have a few <laughs> days left. Maybe it's you know the, a surprise at the end of the year. But I would like to see, so far the focus has very much been on um, individual personal immigration and study permits and students, which is good. Uh, I would like to see a little bit more coming from him for the business, uh, the average business person, the applicant who's looking to start a business in Canada. Uh, would love to see a de dedicated stream, would love to see what they decide to do with the startup visa program. So I'm reserving, I'm holding on to uh, my assessment for now. I want to see what he's, what comes uh, in the next six months as well and and what uh, he puts forward. Owen, what, what, do you have anything to add with respect to our new minister and the former immigration minister becoming the housing minister right now? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> uh, I, I think a lot of my comments are echoed in what Miriam said. It's difficult to be able to, to evaluate in, in a six-month period, but I do think that uh, of some of the trends that we saw with just sort of the IRCC's training and how they're evaluating applications. I think after Mark, uh, you know, Mr. Minister Miller was uh, put into the position, I think it's kind of increased slightly. And I, it don't make sense, you know, given a new, uh, new leadership, I think new leadership typically wants to move relatively quickly rather than, you know, go very slow uh, and, and try to make, try to make uh, their, their mark on the, you know, the, the position. And so, um, they made they made some significant changes within the study permits, and I think from like the back end and how they're enforcing a lot of their immigration policies, I, I think that they're kind of becoming a lot. Like, they're gradually becoming more and more strict and following more, uh, more and more clear guidelines behind that, which is uh, you know good to see rather than sort of just a very ambiguous uh, criteria that isn't always consistent. Um, with that being said, in terms of going back to uh, the Sean Fraser and now in the, the housing market, I think uh, it's kind of funny because he's now calling for more uh, more housing into relation to the immigration that he himself is trying to to accelerate in his role. <laughs> I can't comment too much about his effectiveness in the housing market. I think that's going to have to be to seen. But I, I do. Um, it, it's good to actually have his perspective because you know having him understand the the volume of which he you know Canada is growing especially through immigration and really getting a lot and I think he took a lot of criticism and a lot and took a lot of feedback well in his position and time at leading the immigration Canada and so I think having that knowledge in the housing market is very going to is going to be very useful to be able to to understand uh, the urgency of why which we need housing in Canada so I mean I, I think that should play out as that case, but you know, I guess we'll see uh, what the next year will will hold, and uh, maybe I'll be saying a different tune 
come yeah. mad. <laughs> That's right. Well, we'll see. This is uh, the irony of uh, the fact is that uh, the former immigration minister now becoming the housing. He has a housing portfolio. Now let's see how creative he can be. Okay, great. Now you mentioned about the growth of population in Canada, uh, mostly due to the uh, non-permanent residents. Uh, it's a Statistics Canada mentioned uh, that it's about 40, 40 million plus 500,000, 40.5 million people in Canada right now. Taking into account the unemployment rate is about 5.7% at the moment, Owen, correct me if I'm wrong, but what do you see that next year will bring us in terms of pressure, growing population, the housing how do business immigrants uh, get ready for for the new year 2024 yeah so i mean i i don't see a significant change in our immigration trend i think the i think the government's um still trying to aim for about 500 pr every year uh we might see a slight like a slightly lower growth like i mentioned that they're becoming uh, enforcing and making the barriers to entry into canada via work permit and and study permit a, a bit higher and so we might be able we might see a slight reduction in total work permits being issued but in terms of like the overall trend in immigration for, uh, i think that it'll be generally the same for next year how that would affect businesses again with when you're setting the bar to be a bit higher i think they're going to start prioritizing more, I mean, it was always sort of inherent in the significant benefit that they want more investment to more rural communities and smaller communities that need workforce uh, and need specific types of businesses. I think we're going to see more of a prioritization in that and less of a an emphasis into going into those bigger markets, especially those markets that are already struggling with with housing. Uh, the existing populations like Toronto and Vancouver are having a very difficult time, and and price prices uh, house prices. Though they have been flat and, and you know, maybe even decreasing in some areas, they're still quite high um, and, and very difficult for people to purchase. And so I think prioritizing smaller communities is something that, you know, was a trend already in 2023, but I think that it'll become even more important in 2024. I mean, at least that's my prediction. Great, great. Mariam, your, your take on the whole issue of 2024 immigration, what, what should we expect? uh what should we expect versus what i would like to see um, yes well, <laughs> <laughs> um i think housing is gonna be a very big one i think it's gonna have as owen said a huge impact as well because um it, again in areas where there's already a crisis it's gonna factor in especially i'm i'm gonna you take a very, very educated guess and say that the ministries are communicating. Um, and so while I, I don't necessarily think that there will be a push to uh, dissuade people from hitting uh, these big cities and uh, like uh, immigrating to these big cities, uh, so much as I expect to see more incentivized programs and streams for uh for smaller towns or smaller cities that need investment, that need business, that need, um, like are going through a, a bigger population crisis. So um, I would expect to see a lot more activity from the PNP programs. Um, I would love to see more uh, active role from the, the provinces in attracting businesses and business people and supporting them. So I'm hoping that's, what, uh, that's what's coming in 2024. Um, it is the reality that it's, you know, immigration, housing, they're separate, but they're very intertwined. I don't think we're going to see um, see those two divorced from each other. And I think that'll reflect in the programs, uh, not just in business immigration, but in immigration in general that we're seeing. Um, but yeah, my hope, my wish list is to see more of a dedication to business immigration, specifically streams towards uh, or pathways for permanent residents, other than the SUV program that are specifically dedicated dedicated and tailored to the um, the entrepreneur, the self-employed person, the business owner. Great. Now let's take another question from the audience. Ratings and Review is asking, in an application for work permit extension under the SUV Sarda Visa program, are, are open work permit for SUV applicants in effect now? Are applicants required to provide proof of funds with that kind of application? 
because uh, let me give you a background. You know, both of you, that in, in summer, in June of this year, Minister, former Pr Minister Sean Fraser announced that they will be issuing three-year open work permit for SUV applicants. But it wasn't very clear whether new, new SUV applicants will be given that privilege too. There are rumors at the moment in the industry that stakeholders of Startup Visa program are talking to the government and trying to persuade that open work permit should be given across the board for C SUV applicants. What's your take on this? It's, is it, will it be permanent or as the question uh, asks, what, what are the requirements? What, what, what needs to be done? I think with the SUV program specifically, it's hard to predict if anything is going to be permanent, to be honest. There's been a lot of discussion about what the future of the program entirely will be with some uh, advocating that it's ineffective and needs to be uh, either completely replaced or um, or significantly uh, modified. Um, so that's, I think, the, the foundation we should set is it's business as usual for now, but um, it wouldn't be surprising if there were a lot of changes. Um, in terms of the optional work per, uh, open work permit, um, I think it would be great. I think employer, uh, sorry, entrepreneurs rather, um, would really benefit from the flexibility. Right now, it's um, honestly the startup, the closed startup uh, visa uh, optional work permit is not significantly different to be honest from a c11 work permit other than you have to provide proof of funds which uh is an added requirement especially now that they're ex they've added the significant benefit component to that work permit uh to the startup visa work permit so um in comparison benefits drawbacks i i don't think the existing one the one that's ex uh, right re readily available is any better or worse necessarily than uh the the regular c11 work permit obviously from a financial aspect it's it's definitely worse having to prove uh, the proof of funds so um it would be great to extend that three-year open work permit if the goal is to to attract ultimately innovators to canada to start businesses to bring capital to bring new ideas um i don't think uh the closed, I don't think an open work permit would detract from that. I think actually it would be a bigger incentive for people and a bigger safety net that, you know, if for whatever reason their business is not able to take off, if their business is not able to generate significant benefit or if they need to pivot, they have the flexibility to do that. And we're not losing key talent, key, key innovators and key resources and funding um, in the process. So yeah, I would love to see it. I would love to see it uh, become a permanent fixture. Yeah, uh, good, good insights, Mariam. Just to add on that, uh, related to proof of funds, if we go uh, with the government's logic, allowing entrepreneurs to work anywhere with an open work permit while their startups may or may not generate any income for their living in, in Canada, then proof of funds becomes more important. You have to prove that you will have some resources to, to cover your family's expenses, your living expenses in Canada, now taking into account all the you know, housing prices going up and it's difficult to, to find the affordable housing in Canada, in major cities of Canada. So proof of funds will probably will stay as is, while open work permit for the new SUV applicants could be a, a good, good solution going forward, uh, to my mind. So, Okay, great. Now we have another question. Let's take uh, the second question from the audience. Bake Grains of Hope, is that's the username, is asking the following question. What can be done when someone from Egypt has been rejected for PR application due to insufficient time in Canada? Uh, will, uh, will, okay, what is happening in Gaza? Will what is happening in Gaza have any effect at all? I think the question is uh, the PR residency requirement has not been sufficiently uh, covered, completed. That's why the PR is being re renewed. The renewal has been rejected, if, I'm, if, I, if I correctly interpreted this question. Mariam, uh, any, any idea on that? Any response to that? 
Yeah, I, I interpreted it the same um, in that PR renewal uh, has been re like rejected because of insufficient time. Um, it's definitely worthwhile to appeal. It's definitely worthwhile. There's um, mechanisms to appeal, especially on inter uh, humanitarian and compassionate grounds. So, for example, if I'm going to read into this question, if the reason, uh, you know, there was in the there was insufficient time in Canada is related to a, um, you know, a global conflict, what's happening in Gaza, what's happening in the Middle East in general. Um, I know a lot of places in the world, similarly, there's um, difficulty coming and going um, that may impact. Uh, there is something to be said about appealing on humanitarian and compassionate grounds. Um, it's difficult to comment without knowing the specifics, uh, but what I can say is there are mechanisms and especially with PR, um, I would definitely encourage um, Bake grains of hope to um, take a look at what opportunities are uh, are available to them. Um, yeah, in terms of generally what's happening in Gaza and how this will have uh, what effect this will have on immigration, um, time will tell. We have seen the government uh, and IRCC introduce specialized programs for um, you know Ukrainians for um, you know there's the Afghan pro Afghanistan program as well. So it's not outside of the realm of possibility, but there's nothing uh, as far as I know on uh, the horizon or milling about uh, on that front. So yeah, yeah. The, many, many uh, groups, many stakeholders are pushing government to come up with a similar solution for the uh, problem in Gaza, for the conflict in Gaza, mm -hmm. as they did for the earthquake situation in Syria and Turkey. And so could be, I hope, um, it is my, my wish list in the new year, that we will see something similar that are ad ad addressing the, the, those who are suffering from that war in the Middle East. And, and this question has a lot of, um, you know, needs to be analyzed thoroughly, the person's you know, individual situation, how many days they actually lived in Canada, or they didn't live in Canada at all within the PR period. So it's, it's, I, I suggest that you, uh, you know, get in touch with a personal immigration lawyer who does personal immigration and consult them thoroughly before, doing, uh, for, before taking further steps. And I hope uh, for a quick resolution of, you, of that matter. Now, another question uh, came from Sid Makino is asking, is the ICT business plan, in the ICT business plan, if we are not planning to hire Canadians, in the first year of op operations of a new affiliate, what would be another option? Is that a no-go for the approval of the work permit? Uh, Owen, maybe you can, you can take a stab at that. Yeah, um, so for that question, in terms of not hiring Canadians, I guess like the, the, the follow-up question would be like, are you hiring Canadian agencies or is there, what's the purpose of, uh, of coming to Canada then? Are you, you know, how are you doing business? It sort of depends depending on like how the business is in interacted. But if you really don't have to be there to be able to execute the business, then I would say that you should probably try to do. And I know this isn't always the best thing in terms of like urgency with trying to immigrate. But if you can and you're able to outsource this, why don't you try to do that before coming to Canada to validate that business? Uh, beforehand, I think that would help. And then when you're ready to hire Canadians, then be able to um, to be able to come to Canada and and apply under that work permit. In terms of like the the no go, and I'll I'll let Mayor sort of comment a bit more on this um, yep. further. But it, for the approval of it, I, I believe that the intercompany transfer requires you to have, you know hold a, a managerial type position, and you need to show managerial function. Uh, and so you know coming to Canada and having absolutely no one work under you, uh, I think would be a uh, it would impact negatively the the chances of getting a work permit approval, but. Like I said, I'll, I'll let Mariam comment. Yeah, further. before I, I pass the question further to, to Mariam, uh, can we get the question on the screen again, please? Yeah. Uh, I think the more deeper question uh, is that if we don't give any benefit to the Canadian, let's say, economy in terms of hiring someone, what other benefits could they argue in their application saying that, okay, I'm moving this manager to, to Canada, but this is how Canada can benefit of that 
venture maybe it's not necessarily hiring someone on a payroll but what other benefits can they argue in their application mariam yeah so um like i mentioned there's there's always the ability to also outsource to canadian um to other canadian firms you know maybe there's specific um skill sets that can't like a canadian firms bring that not able to get in other countries it sort of again depends a bit more on the type of business and then it's also, as we mentioned earlier, like uh, cultural and social benefits are two other factors outside of just pure economic benefits for Canada. Uh, so, you know, you could really highlight the, I don't let's say let's a, let's say it's a very unique type of service. Um, let's say it's something like you're doing uh, you know, sustainability consulting uh, around those lines. And so you can really highlight, you know, the, the social aspect of, you know, imp- improving the environment of Canada and, uh, and be able to to leverage that in the application for the significant benefit portion. Um, there there are other ways around that. Oh, I see a, a follow up yeah, to a follow up question. <laughs> um, well, let's let's take that. My services are executed in my home country. I would bring all my international contracts and intellectual property to Canada. So, yeah. So again, like in in that case, it's it's as it's really like, why do you need to be in Canada to be able to do this work? And from that line, it doesn't really seem like there is a huge need to do it. Again, I really want to explore where the services in Canada or North America, or how you can leverage Canada in general to be able to help grow and execute the business um, further is something that you want to be able to consider if you're not going to be, um, you know, hiring or, you know, growing an established Canadian customer base. Um, Mm -hmm. So, as okay. just some some, some uh, areas to consider. Yeah, Mariam, anything uh, you want to add on that? Yeah, Owen hit uh, a lot of really great points. Um, what I want to reiterate is one, the managerial or executive component, obviously to manage, like the ICT program is available to three categories of people, right? Um, senior executive, senior managers and executives, uh, functional managers and um, specialized knowledge workers. So in this respect based on what i'm what i'm reading into um the question we're looking at managerial right sid is planning to you know add a branch of his business uh, or their business to canada and uh, operate it um you can't divorce the managerial aspect from that and yes you can outsource um some services uh ideally you want to outsource to canadians to show that significant benefit as well the opportunities created for canadians um you can argue significant benefit from other lenses yes um intellectual property um international contracts diverting funds to canada all this is is possible but you can't divorce it from the managerial uh, and executive uh requirement Mm -hmm. um you also want to factor in as well you know Everyone's asking the question now that, you know, double edged sword, remote work is possible. It's recognized. Why in this case, do you need to physically be in Canada and have your own physical presence be in Canada if all the services can be outsourced and executed um, abroad? Um, And then third of all is you also want to be able to demonstrate the long term plan for the business, right? If Mm -hmm. the goal is do a quick stop by to, um, you know, to show that there is a physical presence in Canada, but the intention is to really run the business uh, completely from abroad. If I'm an immigration officer, I'm asking what is the long term benefit of giving this person uh, the work permit, allowing them or uh, facilitate allowing helping facilitate the their business in Canada, if in the long term, it's not going to really bring anything up to fruition. So Mm -hmm. those are three considerations and those are key considerations that will um you know come along much much sooner than people expect because for startup work permits the the duration is one year right so these questions are going to be asked within a year um and you know we can go into the snowball effect of like what this means long term if you want to apply for pr and um you want uh, to rely on your business to help you with your PR, then it needs to be functional, it needs to have employees. If you're going to claim that you're a manager, a senior manager, you have to be able to demonstrate that. So I always recommend people cast their thoughts far into the future rather than just the immediate, uh, you know, short term uh, to see what is the vision, what is the plan and what is the overall picture going to look like? Um, Because the worst thing is to invest 
two, three, four years trying to build something and put something together and then reach a stage where you're trying to regulate and transition to PR and realize it's not actually possible because you didn't think that far ahead into the Mm -hmm. future and Mm -hmm. how your business is going to play off. To stay updated on all things related to Canadian business immigration, check us out on social media. Follow us on Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter for the latest news and updates. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the notification bell to stay informed about the most recent immigration news, interviews with top immigration specialists, and our weekly live shows. Visit our website at www.sabirovs.com for more information or to book a consultation with our team of experts. We are back again with you and your questions. Uh, I will reserve only one question from my own list. But I will continue with the live questions uh, from the audience. Let's uh, l- uh, get another one. Zakirov is asking the following question. I really appreciate your efforts. Thank you very much. Well, my question is that I'm a PDR. Uh, I don't know what PDR stands for, but as, as it, is it possible to open this service in Canada, namely PDR Paintless Dent Repairing? Three two two three masters needed to masters to do that. Uh, probably paintless dent repairing. It, it's dentistry as as far as I know. So what do you think? What's that market open in terms of dentistry and probably regulated professions like dentistry and repair shops like that? Uh, yeah, I like how your mind went to dentistry. I, my mind went to like auto body work when I read. Oh, paint. okay. Probably okay. Oh, oh, let's let's take both. Uh, let's oh. imagine this is a, maybe Zakirov can uh, clarify PDR. What is, what is that? Stand- <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll just kind of go broadly off that. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. Difficult to be able to, to give the exact, um, uh, you know, opportunities for it because one, I'm not entirely sure what it is, uh, but two, you know, Canada is a very broad market. So when you think about bringing a service to it, yes, I, I think technically any service could work in Canada because it, it has viability depending on where you're going. There's markets that are, ah, yes, okay. I was oh, right with you. It's an auto body, sorry. Yeah, yeah it's an <laughs> auto body. So if you have any scratch or dent, uh, God forbid, an accident, so you go to, yeah. to PDR. Okay, yeah. So, so I was actually, uh, so, you know, I'm in the Toronto area. Uh, there's a lot of cars, but where I am, there's not a whole lot of uh, car ownership um, just because of the ability to get on transit. And so in this case, like, would a paint, uh, a paintless dent repairing company do as well? Uh, perhaps not. Uh, whereas I was actually just driving through Alberta a couple of days ago, uh, where you know ninety nine percent of everyone commutes via uh, via car, uh, and so with a lot more car ownership and a lot more opportunities to get into accidents, I think that that's uh, a, a very uh, useful service for that area. Again, it's going to be kind of looking at that more you know local or even regional level of competition to see. How far would someone actually realistically drive to an auto body shop? Maybe, I don't know, 50 kilometers or something around that line. Uh, And so you want to kind of be able to look within that radius to see what's uh, going to be, uh, you know, uh, your competitors. I'd also say you want to think about your budget as well. Uh, Auto body repair shop, I I imagine you're going to need quite a bit of equipment, quite a bit of space. And so those are investments that you're going to need to think of up front to be able to open that. Uh, So in short, to the to the answer, yes, it is possible. But I think getting into a lot more of the details and the nitty gritty is where the business planning is going to uh, is going to be really crucial to being able to set up the business for success. Great, uh, and you can always book a consultation at sobirovs.com to go into details of your business plan and what you're trying to achieve by coming to Canada. So next question is from Nigeria, uh, Wells Om- Omorui uh, is asking. I'm from Nigeria. I'm a I'm a businessman in my own country as owner. I want to relocate to Canada to start a company my, with my family. Uh, basically, my wife, six, year, six month old kid, my mom, two adopted kids, and my nanny. Wow. Uh, okay. Uh, with the, uh, I'm trying to read from the screen. I apologize. With the sum of 300,000 US dollars proof of funds, what's the possibility of getting work permits? and how long it will take to get permanent residency. Thanks for the show. Okay. Anyone who can take that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a loaded question. I think uh-huh. It's kind of a 
between uh, what I can provide and what Owen can provide. Um, what I'll say this again, there's not a one size fits all. Um, there's also considerations here is the intention to expand existing business? Is it to start something new? Um, there's also multiple immigration programs that would need to be uh, assessed here. So for uh, himself and his wife and uh, child, that could be all under one application. His uh, mother would be on need to be on a different kind of application, different kind of pathway. Uh, and his nanny would need to be a completely different immigration program. So we're talking yes. about multi-level um, streams here and different programs. Um, in terms of whether 300 USD will be enough proof of funds, um, in a very uh, true loyal, lawyer fashion, it depends. It depends what the investment is going towards. It depends how asset heavy uh, the business uh, is. It depends where it's located and what the cost of doing business is. So to say yes or no, it's it's a very gray. It's a gray area. It's it's not a black and white answer. Um, you, you, there's a lot of factors that would need to be assessed, and that's really what our team our business associates do as well is they take the concept, they take the location, they take the plans and they assess, okay, what is the financial feasibility and what is the necessary investment? Um, in terms of how long it would take to get permanent residence, um, the quickest would be two years. That's if within the first year of establishing a business, it's fully up and running. It's got everything down. You can prove executive managerial duties. You qualify for a PR program. And if it's processed within the six months that it's supposed to be processed in. So quick, the absolute quickest could be uh, two years. Um, it can take anywhere from three to five, possibly longer, depending on how the business is going, depending on what programs uh, each person's eligible for. And also, just to add to that question, that's a very um, several questions into gathered under one umbrella. There's a, a mentioning of adopted kids and adopt, mm -hmm. adopted children are also part of the family, just to clarify. And uh, as Mariam said, it's not only multi-level, but multi-step process to bring all the uh, individuals that, is, that are mentioned in this uh, question. Thank you for the question. Let's go to the next one. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, Zakirov mentioned that I did research Calgary and Edmonton and it seems to be the best uh, location for auto repair. Uh, okay, uh, Sid is clarifying, I'm an executive in long term. The idea is to have a big team. I'm in Bra I have in Brazil over 140 people working. It's just not happening in the first year, I see. Okay, yeah, thanks for clarification. I saw some questions. Uh, if you go up, uh, I, uh, there's a question from uh, Subramanian. Yeah, that's the question. Uh, Jayapriya is asking the following question. Is this, is, it, is this possible to enter tourism visa, get a tourist visa, and after that change into work visa? I, short answer, yes. Until February 2025, there's a policy that you can change your tourist temporary resident status to a work, work permit status if you get a job offer within Canada without exiting the country. So that's the policy and effective until 2025, February of 2025. Is that anything to add, Mariam, on that? Uh, I would just add to be careful here of intent. So when they ask about purpose of visit to Canada, purpose of travel to Canada, if you know that your intention is to apply for a work permit and come and work, um, you want to be very, very careful. There's been uh, cases and case law coming out of um you know related to misrepresentation, which is very serious, uh, where officers have, you know, refused or, you know, given out misrepresentations. Um or be, sorry, bans for misrepresentation on the basis of incomplete um, intent. So even if you have one intent, which is to visit, and you have a second intent, which is to work, you have to be very careful of how you stagger these and how you present these, and um, be very careful not to um, cross into the area of misrepresentation. Um, disclosure and transparency is always important. This is definitely, it sounds like there's a more long-term uh, plan uh, in place that this person is considering. Um, I, we can have conversations about why the interest in coming first on a visa and not a straight work permit, what the perceived benefits um, 
could be. Um, and, you know, it's good to have those conversations with uh, an immigration lawyer um, to determine, do you even need to do a visa first or can you go straight into the work permit? Why, what would be the benefit of waiting versus not? But um, yeah, officers are getting a lot more discerning. Officers are getting a lot stricter as well. Um, and, you know, the federal court has become a lot stricter as well about what counts as a misrepresentation um, and what counts as omitting information that can lead to a misrepresentation. Mm -hmm. So um, short okay. story, be careful. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And plan accordingly and always consult with a licensed Canadian immigration lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are interested in doing business immigration, we are ready to help with our experienced team. You can find out more at sobirovs.com website. My last questions, and thank you both of you for taking such a long time to answer all the, all the questions we received and the, all those questions that I received prior to our show today. So if, two questions. Uh, what, looking ahead in 2024, now many people are watching us, international audience uh, from different parts of the world. What, what are your wishes for those who are planning to make a transition to Canada, to relocate to Canada in 2024, how they should get ready, anything, any tips, life hacks, and so on. Each of you, please. I guess I'll, I'll go first. I don't know if I have many life hacks, but <laughs> my, my wish list is to, to start early. Um, I, I know a lot of clients come to us and they say, hey, we want to immigrate as soon as possible. And I understand uh, the draw for that, but in terms of the planning stages and thinking about starting a business, it it's very rare for a successful business to go from zero to a hundred. Uh, it's going to take a lot of time and experimentation and trying things and pivoting and being able to uh, to adapt and and because we work in a, a virtual world, you're able to to be able to take some of those steps, even reaching out to people in the community to see whether or not, let's say, you're going to open a uh, an African grocery store in a, in a rural community. It'd be good to, to reach out and to see whether or not that's going to be uh, well accepted. And I think being able to take those steps uh, towards making the business and making progress towards it is going to be very useful, even in terms of the application process, but also setting yourself up for success there as well. Um, the other the other wish list aspect is just to understand that can Canada is not... Um, it is is a different market and Canada from my from my I've been around the entire province and it's a different market from from one province to another or even from one town to another uh, the the demographics change the the way of life is, is a lot different uh, and I can attest to that again being out in uh, rural Alberta uh, <laughs> recently and so understand that that what you maybe are doing in one country you it's not necessarily like a plug and play into and this is maybe more for the ict but it's not a plug and play into another country it's not just because a, a concept or business development uh or an idea works in you know let's say pakistan does not mean it will translate uh perfectly to canada and so you want to be able to understand that 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 it is a different market and that you want to to again that's where the planning stages come in to make sure that your the business is going to be viable before you do it and so that's my that's my wish <laughs> that's great, a bit more great. Wish oh, well, thank you very much and now mariam uh yeah in terms of tips and tricks i i'm right there with owen take your time i know you know it's there's always a sense of urgency to like get moving quick, 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 which is fine. But you also want to take a look at what the long term investment is and the investment is worth the time, um, whether that's just setting up an, a, a functional, successful, successful business in Canada or really relocating. Um, you're going to put in the time, you're going to put in the effort, you're going to put in the funds, you're going to put in, you know, relocating your entire family sometimes. Um, take your time, make sure that you plan ahead and give yourself the space to work towards your goals. Um, that would be my biggest tip, whether it's for ICT, whether it's for, um, you know, C11, whether it's for startup visa, take your time, make sure you have things planned out. Slow and steady wins the race. Um, in terms of my wish list, I would love to see something, maybe it'll, you know, just the season, maybe it'll come earlier, but something with the uh, IMP innovation stream, um, that's been something that's been on the horizon and they've been teasing us with it for, for six months. So interested to see what that uh, ends up looking like. 
definitely the renewal of the H-1B specialized uh, visa program. I think that was great. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of demand for it. If the entire program maxed out in 48 hours, I can only imagine what the demand is. Um, and in general, I would love to see more of an emphasis, an intentional emphasis on creating um, more accessible and more varied temporary and permanent resident pathways for business owners and business people to Canada. Um, there are a lot of exciting things that are happening under treaties, like treaty investor programs. I'd love to see the provinces take a much um, more uh, frontline approach um, uh, to all of this. You know, we can talk on a federal level about what what programs need to exist, but provinces really know um, what's happening internally best. And they they're in a prime position to be able to uh, facilitate um, growth and investment in their own territories and their own borders. So those are my three on my wish list mm -hmm. is to see more directed effort. Great. Thank you very much for both of you and for our audience. If we couldn't get to your questions, we apologize in advance. And I suggest that you book a consultation with our experts. And uh, my tips for the new year and going forward is stay connected. We we do these shows with this kind of conversation, open conversations with our audience. Send us your feedback, subscribe to our newsletter and different social media channels. We will see new programs re reopened like Quebec Investor Immigrant Program uh, in January 2024. We'll keep you posted. Anything developing in Canada in terms of immigration and business immigration in particular, you will find out at sobirovs.com and our social media channels. Thank you for your active participation today. Thank you to my, uh, to my guest and happy holidays. We will see you in the new year. Thank you. Take care.